everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching the Battle of Pharsalus by Historia Civilis. Last time, we actually saw a brief glimpse of this battle. Uh, it was the battle in which Caesar finally defeated Pompey, the end of the Civil War. And this video is going to give us a little more depth and more detail on that battle, so I'm excited to watch it. If you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. And without any further ado, let's jump into this reaction. Caesar's civil war had begun. Caesar had marched on Rome and Pompey and many senators fled to Greece. Yep. Someday I'll spend an entire video deconstructing the <laughs> words Caesar marched on Rome, but- Someday, and uh, we already watched that video, uh, which was uh, a while down the line from this one, but of course we're watching all of them in retrospect, so we get to see the old content. This video is a little older, alongside the new content. For today, I'll skip right over that part. Caesar's old pal Bibulus had been given command hmm. of the Adriatic fleet and had been ordered. Uh, his old pal, aka Caesar's old co consul, who had been humiliated <laughs> his entire time in office by Caesar. If we remember Bibulus, he basically couldn't get anything done. Um, because Caesar just completely humiliated him and wouldn't let him do anything. Uh, it was, you know, a pretty bad time for Bibulus. ...to prevent Caesar from crossing into Greece. Side note, Romans don't really respect naval warfare. Admirals mm. were seen as less than generals, and Roman navies tended to fall under the command of ex-preachers, or sometimes old ex-consuls as a way to, like, put them out to pasture. Yeah, well, we recently watched, well... But at the time this video comes out, it might not be so recently, but we watched Oversimplified's video on the First Punic War, um, and we saw in that that Rome had to sort of build up its navy to defeat Carthage. And following that war, you might think, ah, so naval warfare became more important to the Romans? Not really. Rome was always primarily a land empire, um, and so their navy would grow over time, and they would be the dominant naval power of the Mediterranean, but naval power and naval warfare was never, ever their focus. They were always more focused on land combat. Uh, and so, like Historius Villas said, the navy was never that big a deal to the Romans. Um, and while they were the dominant naval power of the Mediterranean, simply because they were just the dominant power of the Mediterranean, they would never get that good at naval combat. Bibulus was an ex-consul, and he'd been the governor of Syria, which on paper should have landed him at the head of an army, or at least as one of Pompey's advisors. But as we know, Bibulus's term as consul was extremely embarrassing, as was his term as governor for totally different reasons. <laughs> oh. The fact that Pompey stuck him in left field commanding the Adriatic fleet was honestly a slap in the face. I mean, it, it, to me, it seems like there's two aspects to Bibulus. One is that um, he's in some ways, sort of a sympathetic figure because of how fucked over he was by Caesar during his consulship. Um, on the other hand, it does seem like he was sort of genuinely incompetent to a certain extent. You know, he was not the most skilled leader around. Um, so there's both a bit of sympathy there and also, you know, it doesn't sound like he was that great a commander. Uh, so overall, a pretty pathetic figure, I would say. But this was Biblos's moment. He was now responsible for keeping Caesar in Italy. Time dragged on and winter set in. During the winter, everything kind of shut down. Armies didn't march and ships didn't sail. So Bibulus did the normal thing and brought his navy into port. Caesar launched an unexpected and daring crossing of the Adriatic. This was extremely dangerous, but not totally unprecedented. He had done the same thing when he crossed the Rubicon last year. In the end, Caesar... And we mentioned last time, uh, one of the reasons Caesar was able to do this is because the Roman calendar was so out of whack um, because of Caesar, who was in charge of it and who hadn't tended to the calendar in a few years, that the calendar basically said that it was winter even though it was fall. And so Bibulus thought, well, it's impossible to make a winter crossing. Um, and he might have been right, but Caesar wasn't making a winter crossing. He was making a fall crossing. And so Caesar used... Um, sort of his mistake in letting the calendar get uh, so far separated from reality in order to sort of pull the wool over Bibulus's eyes uh, and make that crossing. Caesar and his army were in Greece before anybody even noticed anything. 
When Bibulus started to get reports that Caesar was no longer in Italy, he immediately knew what had happened and mobilized <laughs> the fleet. He caught Caesar's empty ships on their return trip, but it didn't do him much good. Bibulus would maintain his naval blockade for the rest of the winter, but at some point he got sick and he died at sea. Mm -hmm. He died as he lived, disappointingly. <laughs> oh, in Greece, damn. Caesar had a... I mean, Historia Civilis is right. And I, I did literally just call him a pathetic figure, but you do have to feel a little bit bad for Bibulus. Um, I mean, because he was pathetic. <laughs> Fairly bad initial clash with Pompey's army, and he was forced to withdraw. His army was now cut off and undersupplied, thanks to Bibulus. Mm -hmm. According to Caesar, Pompey had 45,000 infantry and 7,000 cavalry, while Caesar had 22,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry. According to Caesar, so, you know... Whenever we talk about Caesar's conquests, keep in mind that our main source is usually Caesar. This is particularly true for his time in Gaul. So whatever numbers Caesar's, Caesar gives you, uh, you should be very skeptical of because he's probably going to inflate the number of men the enemy has uh, and, you know, decrease the number of men that he had uh, because he wants to make his victories look more impressive and his losses look more justifiable. Now, these numbers come directly from Caesar, so let's not take them too seriously. Right. But everybody agrees that Caesar was significantly outnumbered. The prelude to ancient battles tended to have this rhythm to them, where the two armies would basically dance back and forth with each other for sometimes weeks at a time. Each army would deploy every day, stare at each other, and then retire at night having done nothing. Maybe the scouts would get into a bit of a tussle, but that would be it. Each army would be seeking the slightest advantage. When one side believed they had the edge, they would try to force the battle to begin. This little dance was an underrated part of the job, but Caesar was eerily good at it. Mm. He could go back and forth for a solid month with seemingly infinite patience. You know, that makes sense to me because what we've seen of Caesar in the past is that he is very good at pulling these tricks over his enemies, you know, small or large things that will end up winning him the battle. He's also very good at sort of reading his opponent and then playing mind games against them um, to force them to give up some of their advantages or intimidate them or, you know, force them into a battle that isn't advantageous for them, whatever it is. So I think it makes a lot of sense that Caesar would be skilled at that. So when Pompey and Caesar entered visual range of each other, they began their dance. Pompey's opening move was to deploy up on the hill, which put mm. him at an undeniable advantage. He was in friendly territory. He had a larger army. He was better supplied. He could afford to take his time and force Caesar into a bad position. A few days passed, and it started to become clear to Caesar that Pompey wasn't coming down off the hill. He ordered his men to start breaking camp. Maybe if he withdrew, Pompey would give chase and Caesar could find a better place to fight. Then, just as Caesar was getting ready to leave, Pompey deployed down off the hill with a river on his right flank. Apparently, there was some infighting among Pompey's advisors. They had already beaten Caesar in a non-decisive battle, and everybody was telling Pompey to quit playing with Caesar and get it over with. Yeah, I mean, we saw that last time, how Pompey had defeated Caesar in their, you know, battle of building walls as quickly as they could, uh, and then Pompey basically took it easy, you know, he... Uh, gave Caesar a chance to recuperate, uh, whereas a lot of his advisors and a lot of the senators who were stationed in Greek felt that Pompey should have gone for the kill. And I do happen to agree with that opinion. I think Pompey definitely should have just gone for it uh, after he had that, uh, you know, as Historia Civilis Civilis said, non-decisive victory over Caesar. Even though they were deploying on neutral ground, Pompey still believed that he had the advantage. Caesar took the bait. He ordered his men to stop packing up and start getting ready for battle. Pompey had a significant numerical advantage, and when you're in that position, you can either go wide or go deep. He went deep. This made it pretty much impossible for the enemy infantry to break through his line. Mm. His plan was to let Caesar come to him, get bogged down fighting his infantry, and then send his superior cavalry around the side to attack Caesar's flank. Pompey was using the river on his right to his advantage. With the river serving as a shield, he could neglect his right flank and pour all of his energy into one overwhelming push on his left. Yeah, I mean, it's a simple, but uh, I think adequate, you know, um, it's a good plan. You know, Pompey has more men and it's Roman infantry versus Roman infantry, so they'll be relatively even matched, but Pompey has a lot more of them. And so he, he can just even cause a stalemate between the two forces 
Um, he can use his, you know, numerically superior cavalry to swing around and crush Caesar's army. Like I said, relatively simple, but it doesn't have to be complicated if it works. It's a good plan, and if I were smart enough to think right. of it, it's what I would have done. Pompey had the larger army and occupied the battlefield first, so Caesar didn't have a lot of options. He deployed his infantry in the standard three lines of attack, with all of his cavalry on his right. Caesar ordered his first two lines forward. When they got in range, they charged, but Pompey's men didn't move. This was mm. unusual. When Caesar's men noticed this, they abruptly pulled back to regroup. This was an incredible show of discipline, and most yeah. armies could not have pulled this off. That Honestly, that that is very impressive, you know. It's really difficult to stop your men from running, either towards or away from the enemy. Um, you know, if your men are in a full retreat, it's incredibly difficult to turn them around and force them to stand their ground. Similarly, if your men, you know, they're hopped up on adrenaline, they're ready to fight, they're rushing towards the enemy, it is very difficult to get them to restrain themselves, pull back, uh, and, and stay steady. You know, that is an incredible level of discipline. Um, and, I mean, it really shows us the discipline and training of uh, the Roman infantry uh, and Caesar's troops specifically. Of course, the you know Roman troops were sort of famed for their training, their discipline, their ability to hold steady in the thick of battle, and this is a good, very impressive example of that. See, when Roman infantry charged, they would usually break formation when they slammed into the enemy. And if they mm. had done so here, it would have been like hitting a brick wall. So instead of charging, Caesar's units formed up again, took their time throwing their javelins, got into a tight formation, and advanced mm. slowly into Pompey's line. It's a testament to Caesar's highly experienced centurions that they were yeah. able to see what Pompey's men were doing and change their tactics mid-charge. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a very intelligent move and shows a lot of restraint. And I think they're exactly right, given the uh, numerical advantage that Pompey holds. The Caesarian troops really cannot afford to just run in there, breaking formation. They're going to get uh, crushed. I mean, they're going to run into the brick wall of Pompey's infantry and then get smashed by the cavalry. They need to be cautious, keep up their defensive, and advance in a tight formation, which is exactly what they've realized. But despite all of this, Caesar's infantry were now locked down, which is exactly what Pompey wanted. Yeah. As all this was happening, Pompey ordered his massive cavalry on his left to advance. Remember, they were the key to winning this whole thing. Caesar's cavalry responded and charged, but they stood no chance. So after a bit of fighting, Caesar's cavalry broke off and started running back towards their own line. Pompey's cavalry gave chase. All of a sudden, through the dust and the horses and the confusion, Pompey's cavalry could see that there was something right ahead of them. It was Caesar's infantry, about 3,000 of them. Caesar had put his cavalry there to shield his infantry from view. Yep. This wasn't a rout, it was a feint. The infantry had abandoned their swords and were using their javelins as spears. You know, it's a good plan from Pompey, uh, but unfortunately for him, he's up against Julius Caesar. <laughs> and we literally just talked about how Caesar was very good at reading his opponents. So Caesar looked at Pompey's formation, looked at how things were playing out, and realized exactly what Pompey wanted to do. And he said, okay, that's fine. Go ahead. I'm going to be ready for you. <laughs> Perfect for stopping a cavalry charge. At this point, Pompey's cavalry were in a full-out sprint and not in formation or ready in any way when they crashed into Caesar's line of infantry. Yep. This threw everything into total chaos. Pompey's cavalry were totally broken, and they started to flee off the field. Caesar's men didn't give chase, but showed that incredible discipline again and formed up in a mix of cavalry wow. and infantry. Impressive. And advanced as one. They wheeled and engaged Pompey's left flank. I mean, this battle is really a testament to both Caesar's uh, ability to read the battlefield and read his opponents and the incredible discipline and experience of Caesar's men. At the moment of contact, Caesar ordered his third line forward. He now had 100% of his men committed, putting mm. as much pressure as possible on Pompey's line. Things began to fall apart on Pompey's left and continued falling apart in one long chain reaction all the way up to the river. It was a decisive victory. According to Caesar, and it's Caesar, so let's take these numbers with a grain of salt, hmm. he only suffered 200 casualties, 
He also says that 39,000 men from Pompey's army were either killed or captured. Yeah, I'm, I, obviously Caesar wants to paint a flattering picture. And so these are absolutely ridiculous casualty counts. There's no way Pompey lost that many men. And there's no way Caesar lost that few. But what is true is that this was the decisive battle that brought the Civil War to an end. This is how Caesar defeated Pompey. So, you know, Caesar really doesn't have to do this extra work to make himself look good. He still does because he's Caesar. But even without that, this is an incredibly impressive victory. Which is like the whole army. <laughs> but whatever the numbers are, we know that Caesar's losses were superficial and Pompey's were catastrophic. Yeah. There was still some significant campaigning to do, and Caesar would stay busy for the next couple of years winning the Civil War. But after this battle, Caesar was no longer the underdog. All right. There we go. Yeah, I mean, there was still some stuff to clean up. But like I said, this was sort of the decisive battle that ended it. You know, the Pompeians really didn't have a chance following this. Um, yeah, that was interesting. I mean, it, you know, it was a relatively short video, and it's one of his older ones. But, you know, we did get some more detail on the battle that we saw uh, in the last video, in the fall of Pompey, uh, which was, uh, you know, a really good one. And I, I sort of see this as sort of an addition, you know? It was just an addition to that video. And I think it, it definitely served its purpose. We definitely got some more detail. Uh, so, yeah, I, I had a good time with this. Uh, if you guys did, I'd appreciate it. If you would leave a like on this video, subscribe to the channel, and check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. Uh, I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.